Okay, hey folks, welcome back. Um, today we're going to jump right on into our next unit on ancient Egypt, which is super fun. Um, probably something we know a little bit more about than ancient Mesopotamia, but certainly we'll be making lots of links back to Mesopotamia as well. So as always, we're going to start out with talking um, around geography and why geography is so important to the Egyptian people because it is extremely important to them. So we'll chat about that. Um, hopefully you've already looked at your note on Egyptian geography and tried to make some predictions and guesses on your own before uh, you listen to me chat about it. So our essential question for the unit is how does Egypt create a stable continuous civilization for thousands of years? That really is the big thing about ancient Egypt is the fact that for so long, they are able to, you know, 3,000 years, they're able to maintain a very stable, for the most part, very independent civilization with a flourishing culture um, that remains relatively unchanged throughout that 3,000 years. So throughout this unit, we're going to take a look at exactly how they managed to do that. So when we're looking at geography, geography actually plays a big role in answering that question. So as you can see here, just as a reminder for some people, oftentimes we tend to forget that Egypt is in Africa. So we are talking about an early African civilization here. Other things to remember, and you might remember this from, you know, studying ancient Egypt in grade three or something, is that the distinctions we're going to be discussing at times will be between upper and lower Egypt. And you can see based on this map here that Upper Egypt is in the south and Lower Egypt is actually in the north. So the reason for that is because the Nile River actually flows from south to north. So this was considered kind of Upper Egypt and that was considered Lower Egypt because of that flow. So you can see here the question is what geographic advantages and disadvantages do you notice about Egypt? And hopefully, as I said, you looked at that already on your, um, on your note beforehand and you can just add to the ideas that you had already as we chat together. So in the north, <clears throat> um, in the north, what you should have noticed is this Nile Delta. So this kind of triangle full of lots of lot really tiny rivers. Uh, it's a very fertile region. You can see here all of this green is, is fertile region. So really all around the Nile you've got fertility, but especially here on the north in this Nile Delta. Uh, it is this fan shape often too small to be penetrated by large ships. So one advantage for living in the north and for kind of the northern borders of Egypt is the fact that yes, they're connected to the Mediterranean. That's great for trade, it's great for travel and access. In terms of invasion, even though it looks like an easy access point, it's actually very difficult for invaders to get in because the rivers in that Nile Delta are so small that if you had a big ship and you were trying to invade um, and you were coming for Egypt, on the one hand, they could see you coming because of course it's an open sea right there. But on the other hand, it would be very, very difficult for you to get your ships into the Nile. So in terms of the north, it is advantageous, both in terms of being able to watch for invaders, in terms of fertility, um, but also in terms of protection. So that's very important definitely for the people and does create a sense of kind of isolation for the people of Egypt. You can see here in this map, Egypt is down here. So they do have access points throughout the 3000 years of their civilization to trade with all of these areas once you get Rome and Greece and all of those places starting up. In the east, what you should have noticed is desert. And if you remember anything from talking about deserts in Mesopotamia, Certainly, the desert is great in terms of protection and isolation because it's very hard for invaders to get through. It's very difficult. Certainly, nomadic invaders could be traveling through the desert. It's not like it's completely impossible, but it is very difficult. And it's very difficult, especially for a very large army to make their way through the desert. You've also got the Red Sea here. Again, though, not great access from the Red Sea into Egypt. They've still got to go through that desert. And it's also Again, a matter of size, not really easy for big ships to get through. You would need a very well organized fleet um, in order to get through. The other thing about the East is they're able to trade with Byblos, which is kind of up here, for timber. So they actually don't have a lot of very strong heavy wood in Egypt, and you'll look at trade a little bit later. But 
The east is very important for them because they do have a trade route, again, through the Mediterranean Sea to get to the, um, the timber in Byblos in the east. In the south, what you might have noticed is certainly the rest of Africa, um, modern day Sudan, uh, places like that. The really important things for the south is that's our contact with Upper Egypt. So again, we've got the, the Nile River flowing from south to north. In the south, you've also got a couple of powerful kingdoms at different periods in Egyptian history. One of them is the Kingdom of Kush, which yes, is funny now, but the Kingdom of Kush was very powerful at times. Um, sometimes a threat to Egypt, but ultimately nothing really ends up happening. Also, you've got the Kingdom of Nubia later on, and that's very important for the Egyptians because the Nubians have a lot of gold, and so they're able to trade with the Nubian Kingdom to the south for gold, and this is key, especially if you think about King Tut and all of the gold and riches that were found in his tomb. Certainly that's true of riches throughout Egypt, and we'll be looking at a lot of that stuff, of course. There's also a lot of Nubian sandstone. So the Nubians are a great trade partner, um, and they never really come into any kind of like aggressive contact with the Nubians because they have a fairly good stable relationship. The other really important thing, because it would seem that Egypt is kind of open to invasion from the south, the really important thing is, you can see here, these lines along the Nile, one, two, three, four, five, and six, these are cataracts. And so if you were coming from the south and going with the flow of the Nile towards the north and trying perhaps to invade Egypt, at each one of these lines, what you would be hit with is the granite underbed of the Nile pushing up through the river, which actually would make it extremely difficult for large warships to get through because you've got that granite underbed coming up through. You've got to navigate either around that or over top of that. Very difficult for large ships. Even if you manage to get past one, you've got all of these other ones to get through. So actually, even though Egypt appears to be fairly open to invasion and to outsiders from the south, it's actually very difficult still to get up to Egypt. You're either dealing with desert or you're dealing with those cataracts in the Nile, which makes it very hard. In the west, you've got a lot of desert area, once again. So the Libyan desert, just like we said before, protects from invasions. It's possible, but very difficult. Mostly barren. There are a few, and you can see them here in the green, oasis spots. But again, you're kind of traveling through the desert. Are you going to hit an oasis? Are you not? Some of the bigger ones are the Fayum oasis, the Dakla oasis, the Cargo oasis. But even if you manage to hit one of these oasis points, you're still traveling through the desert. Again, very difficult for large numbers of people. The really good thing, the advantageous thing about the desert in the West is that it provides a lot of resources for the Egyptian people. So if they are willing to go out into the desert, they can get a number of things. They can get copper, tin, alabaster, limestone, amethyst, and natron, which is going to be very important when we talk about mummification. It's that kind of salty substance that lets um, the bodies um, mummify. So desert, very important. Other very important geographical things for the Egyptians to think about are the fact that they really felt like the Nile was a gift to them. As we saw in that green picture earlier, it's a very small fertile strip, so all of your civilization is really close to the river itself. It flows south to north, north as we discussed, and the Egyptians really feel blessed by the Nile. They're very ethnocentric. They think that they're the best civilization in the world. They really are not that... Um, interested in trading with other civilizations or acquiring ideas or culture from other civilizations, even though they have the ability to through the Mediterranean Sea. Certainly with the Nubians, they get gold, but they use it for, again, for their own stuff, the things that they like to do as Egyptians. They're not trading for other cultures, um, cultural ideas or anything like that. They also saw a power in the Nile, and so they attributed it to gods, of course. Who is running the Nile? Who's controlling it? And they really saw Egypt as these two lands. And this is a kind of common thread we'll see with ancient Egypt, this idea of duality, that you've got two lands, two things going on, and oftentimes those things don't contradict with each other, they go hand in hand. So the Egyptians are all about order and balance and those kind of dualities and pluralities.
One of those dualities is red versus black, and so you can see here in this visual that the black was that very fertile region around the Nile. It was where irrigation happened, the sown land happened, all of those kinds of things, and the red was that desert area, which was symbolic of death, fear, infertility. And so in Egypt, again, you've got that symbolization of life versus death, the two lands, and the importance of water to live. The fact that you are living around the Nile and you're blessed with the Nile, but you're surrounded by this desert, this death, makes you feel very special because you're given this great land, but also you're contrasted with those other areas. So that's definitely a plays a big part in the Egyptian culture and psyche and the way that they see themselves in the world. In terms of agriculture, you can see here a visual in terms of kind of the flood season. Um, the river, the Nile River is fed by summer monsoons in Ethiopia, so it rains in June. Um, and then it had very pre predictable flooding. They knew it was going to flood in July and August and that they would have fertile soil in order to harvest. So it was very, very predictable. Not predictable was the amount of flooding, and actually the Egyptians again used this to their advantage because kings and then pharaohs were very, um, very focused on wanting to tax their people um, in a way that made sense, in a way that uh, did not put strain on their people because they, again, are all about order, harmony, balance, all of that good stuff. And so every year that the river flooded, they would mark how much it flooded and they would tax people appropriately. So if it flooded a lot, they would tax them more. If it didn't flood as much as the year before, they would cut back on taxes, which again is kind of interesting. So how does this all factor into stability? Isolation and the Nile are key. As I said, they're very ethnocentric. They're also very xenophobic. They don't like other cultures. They feel that they are very superior. They think the Nile was given to us. We're the ones who are blessed with it. So we were born in the best place on earth. We don't need to concern ourselves with other people. What this does is it allows them to very firmly develop a very stable culture and civilization with utter confidence. They don't need to be focused on other people. And not only do they not need to be focused on other people, it's very difficult to get to other people. And it's very difficult for other people to get to them. So when the Egyptians find things that work, basically that's the way that they do it for thousands of years. There is very little change in Egyptian civilization throughout that 3,000 years. We will discuss little periods where there's you know, foreign occupation or foreign invasion. But even those time periods are very short-lived. They're very small. For the most part, Egyptian people have no outside influence and no desire for it, and they are very content with that. They're a very happy people. They love life. Um, and that's really why they are so focused on the afterlife, is they just wanted that life that they love in Egypt to continue on forever. So it's not an obsession with death so much as it is just a love for life. And we'll definitely be talking about that as we start to discuss the evolution of the pyramids and as we start to play around with mummification and some of those fun things. So this is kind of the first way that we're going to answer this question. But as I said, we're going to keep looking at how they maintain and develop this very stable, consistent culture throughout that 3,000 years um, of time together. So thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you guys soon.